We'll be in Exodus 5 through 11 today. Next week, if you would, uh, Exodus 14. Now, if you didn't live through this, maybe you've heard about it. The event took place in 1980. And I know a lot of you weren't born yet in 1980. But there was a question being asked. It wasn't just a common question. It was by far and away, no doubt about it, the number one question in the year 1980. And, and if this gets your mind going, I want to get it going. Because this was not something that just happened here in the United States. This happened all over the globe. It was unusual. It was interesting. It was profound. It was a question that was on everybody's lips. You know what that question was in 1980? It was the question, who shot JR? Remember that? If you were alive in 1980, you're going, yeah, I remember that. Who shot JR? For those of you who were not here in 1980, JR is not some historical figure that was significant to a lot of people. JR was made up. He was a character on a show called Dallas. Believe it or not, uh, there's a lot of things we can learn. Now, JR was JR Ewing. And the reason the world was so consumed with this question, who shot JR Ewing, was it's because, to be honest with you, JR Ewing is the kind of guy that everybody kind of wished would be shot. I mean, he personified the wicked, evil, nasty stuff in this world. He would cheat you, he would lie to you, he would cheat with somebody else on you. I mean, he was just as evil as it got. Uh, if you ever been around a person who did you wrong and cheated on you or lied about you or abused you or even tried to kill you, anything awful, you know, that's J.R. Ewing. And when they created this character, it resonated with people. Did you know a lot of people watch Dallas just to hope that J.R. got something? In fact, they knew they were onto something when they saw Dallas go worldwide. Think about this. They were getting almost a half a billion viewers in, different, in 90 different countries. The Queen of England was watching this show. The Queen of England. This is 1980. The United States had 226 million people in 1980. They were a lot less, they were, there were a lot less people back then, but everybody was talking about it. Here's what happened. It was the end of the third season of Dallas. It was March of 1980. They were given a couple of extra shows, so the writers weren't prepared for that. So they, somebody came up with the idea, let's shoot Jr. It was an easy idea to come up with because everybody wanted to shoot Jr. So here's what they did. They had him in this scene being shot, but they didn't want anybody to know who did it. This was March. The next show wasn't going to come on until November. They didn't want somebody going out and telling, well, I shot Jr. you know. How are we going to do this without letting the cat out of the bag? How are we going to do this? Because people on the set that film this, they're going to tell their friends. The actors and the actresses will tell their family. So here's what they did. They had every cast member take turns at pulling the trigger. Think about that. And here's what made it so believable. The reason I'm going into so much detail is I want you to remember just how nasty this guy was. They filmed his brother. You know who his brother was? His brother was Bobby Ewing. The one guy that was decent on the whole show. But everybody could conceive of Bobby, good old Bobby. You know, I could see, may, I, I might could see Bobby doing that. They filmed his brother. They filmed his wife. They filmed his dad. Think about that. They filmed his dad shooting. They filmed his mom. A mom shooting him. And it's all believable. He was that bad a guy. Well, they filmed the cliffhanger episode in March. And the next episode was to be in November. So you finally get to Friday night, November the 21st, 1980. 
and the show literally shut down America. Restaurants were closing early. It says closed. We're going to find out who shot Jr. You know, half a billion people worldwide, 90 different countries. In the U.S. alone, F folk, there was an election. There was an election 17 days earlier, presidential election. Do you know more people watched the show Who Shot Jr. than voted in the presidential election? By far. And by the way, I'm not going to leave you because I didn't remember this till I looked it up. It was Kristen, okay? <laughs> I only know who Kristen is, okay? But it was Kristen. I, I didn't want to leave that with you. But anyway, <clears throat> the show wasn't really who shot Jr. The sentiment was, thank the Lord somebody shot Jr. you know? All summer long, you'd be out in public, and you'd see. I, I remember being in the, at the tractor pull in 1980. Every county fair I went to, I saw people wearing T-shirts that said, I shot Jr." <laughs> and you probably got one if you lived through that. People were celebrating that somebody gave Jr. what was coming to him. He embodied that which was evil. Here's the concept I want to go with. Wouldn't it be great if you could take everything in life that encumbers, everything in life that, that, that weighs you down, everything in life that is nasty and bad, wouldn't it be great if you could just put that into one bodily form and just get rid of them? Well, folk, it's not that easy. It's not that easy, but I want you to get this concept because the idea of doing away with everything that's bad, with everything that's evil, with everything that encumbers, with everything that weighs you down, with everything that makes life less than what it should be, and the idea of blowing that away is exactly, folks, that's exactly what God wants to do for you and me if we would let him. He wants to give us freedom. He offers us a freedom, and a lot of times we think we're free, but we're not really free. So what we're talking about in the book of Exodus is not just a historical event where God goes in and he takes the Jews who had been held captive for lots of years uh, and sets them free from Egyptian captivity. Yes, it's a historical event. Yes, it's a historical story, but there's a lot more going on. And let me tell you why I know that. I go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I go through the first six verses. I end up with this one little slice. It says, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. The New Living Translation say, these things happened as a warning. There's a lesson here. What happened in the book of Exodus is a seminar. On obtaining, on obtaining freedom in your life, on getting rid of all that weighs us down, on getting rid of all that opposes us. And God has that offer. He wants to set us free. God is teaching us a lot in delivering the Israelites from Egyptian captivity. He's teaching us a lot about what it takes for you and for me to be set free. In fact, there's this one phrase, and you find it nearly 10 times as you read through Exodus 3 through Exodus 12. In these chapters, Moses and Aaron are constantly using this phrase, and it's a very simple phrase that I want to try to use as our foundation today to get some basic lessons. They say this again and again. Let my people go. And I've told you before, Hollywood only got half of it in the movie. That part of the phrase is never used by itself. Every time he says, let my people go, they say, he says another phrase to that. Every time he says, let my people go, maybe that they might have a festival with me. Let my people go so that they might serve me. Or the number one way this is used nearly seven or eight times through these nine chapters in Exodus 9-1, let my people go so that they may worship me. Two lessons, let my people go so that they may worship me. So here it is. I want to talk about this in light of freedom, the problem of freedom. You know what the problem of freedom is? If you have to tell somebody to let them go, what's that mean? That means they're not free. It means, uh, it means they're just not being able to live the way they want to live. And I believe a lot of people here today, you might think you're free, 
but I hate to burst your bubble. You're not. The problem with freedom is more people need it than think they need it. The reason more people need it is because everybody is enslaved to something. One commentator put it this way on this passage. Everybody lives for something, and whatever it is you live for is your master, and you are its slave. Folks, a lot of times we don't want to put it in those kind of terms, but you, would you think about that with me? First of all, everybody lives for something. Is that part of the statement true? Yes, it is. Everybody lives for something, even the person that has a hard time of getting out of bed in the morning. You get out of bed and you do something. You choose this thing over that thing. You choose one thing over something else. <clears throat> and there's a reason why you chose that. You understand what I'm saying? There's some sort of purpose. There's some sort of value system in your life. You choose this over that. And why do you choose this? It's because there's something important in your life. When you dig through this, you're going to find of all the things that are important in your life, one is more important than the others. And when you find that, you found your master. And you're also found that you were a slave to whatever it is that you found. For instance, I know people today that are slaves to addiction. Now, that's an obvious one. That person is entrapped to the drug issue that as soon as they awake, all they can think about is their next fix. And folks, it might not be a fix like we think about. It might be something that we go get from the drugstore. You understand what I'm talking about? They've gotten to the point in their life that it is so important, they are literally slaves to the habit. Folks, that's an easy one. It's a... It, Here's another example. How about this? Some people are a slave to stuff. Ever heard about the stock market crashing and somebody as a result of that, somebody on, on Wall Street goes up to the top of one of these si skyscrapers and what do they do? They jump with no parachute. We get that, don't we? We know what we, sur you know what we surmise. Either that was his job or he had so much invested, he lost it all. And you know what we've said when we acknowledge that? His master let him down. He was a slave to the money, and the money's not around anymore. He was a slave to the job, and the job has disappeared. I know people that are, that are uh, slaves to relationships that are bad. I had, a kid, I had a kid in youth group one time. He was about 18 when I started preaching at that church, and about 25 when this happened. He got involved with a woman across the street where he lived her husband you get this it's not a going a good place her husband was gone her husband came back and she decided she would rather have her husband than the young man in my youth group and what he did he took a gun to himself and you know why his master had let him down he was a slave to that lady and that lady wasn't going to let him be around anymore. How about this one? A slave to enjoyment. I know a man that was a very respected businessman. He gave a lot to the community. He went to church every Sunday. He had kids that went to church camp. I taught them. I did not live in the same community he did. And yet one day he took a trip to down to a boat in Evansville. And it was fun. And he wagered some money. And, and he won some. Pretty soon, you know what happened? He started going back regularly, and this guy, once wealthy, wound up, catch this, divorced, living in his car because he became a slave to something that he enjoyed. Now, that, that, those are way out there. How about let's start hitting a little closer to home? I've been to restaurants. In fact, this might be me sometimes. I've been to restaurants and watched families order and then you know what they all do? They all four or they all six, they, they put their heads down in their phones and they don't look up until the food comes. You ever seen that? I have too. Sometimes I've been that. Shame on me. Check your iPhone out. How much time are you spending a day? Is it your slave? That means it works for you? Or is it your master? That means it controls your time. 
Do you understand what I'm trying to say? There are extreme examples, there are obvious examples, and there are examples that may not make you very comfortable, but I want you to go there with me. There, there is a reason, folk, you get out of bed in the morning. And there's reasons why you spend money on certain things and don't spend money on other things. There's reasons, did you catch this? There's reasons why you give money <coughs> and you use that money instead of putting it someplace else. You see, whatever your ultimate goal is in life, whatever that ultimate purpose is, that determines the way you live your life. And it's not just an ultimate purpose, it's your master. And you are a slave to that. Some people are more spiritually aware of their bondage than other people are, but everybody's a slave to something simply because you're alive. That's lesson number one. Set my people free. And I'll tell you why. Because we're not free. Let my people go so, you may, so they may worship you. Lesson number one is the problem of freedom. Everybody needs freedom because everybody's a slave. Lesson number two is the paradox of freedom. Follow me. I know this sounds like a paradox, and folk, it is. If you want to stop eating bad food, how do you do that? Somebody said, never eat again. <laughs> no, everybody knows this. To stop eating bad food, you've got to eat good food. You really do. You want to stop living in a bad place, what do you do? You've got to move. You've got to find a good place. You don't want to be a slave to sin. You don't want to be a slave to all this stuff that weighs you down. You don't want to be a slave to all this stuff that entangles. You don't want that slavery. You want real, real freedom. You know how to find that? Becoming a slave of God. It's impossible not to live for something. It's impossible. If you're alive, you live for something and you are enslaved. Freedom is not found by eliminating the masters. Freedom is found by finding the right master. I know it's a paradox, but it's true. Here's the way Jesus said it in Matthew 28. After he completed his earthly ministry, after he rose from the dead, he's meeting with his followers. And here's the charge that he gives them. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And when he says, I am the authority, what does that mean? That means he says, I've got life figured out. You want to find freedom? Ask him. You want to find the answers? Ask him. He's got it all figured out. This life down here and the next life. Because he knows this life. And because he knows the next life, he's got it all figured out. All authority in heaven and on earth. He says in verse 19, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Doesn't that sound like bringing people in? Doesn't that sound like a form of bondage? It is, but it is the bondage that brings freedom. He says, you make disciples. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know what that expression means, in the name of? It means you own it. I got a truck right out there. I think it's right out there. I'm kind of turned around again. And I got a piece of paper in my house. And on that piece of paper, it says, that truck belongs to me and Vicki. We own it. It's in our name. I've got the title. I can prove it. And that title shows ownership. That's exactly what he's talking about. To be a follower of God, you're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? It means you've got a new master. And here's the part, folk, that I think everybody misses. They think, okay, when I sell that truck, I'm going to sign that over. I got to take my name off. I got to scratch it out. And here's what they think. In order to have a new master, I've got to write Jesus' name there. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but your name was never there in the first place. As free as you think you might be, whatever it was that you were living for, that was what was in the blank. 
Many people would have to scratch out success. Some would have to scratch out comfort. These things that people are living for, folk, they're not bad things. They're just not the ultimate thing. See, some people would have to scratch out husband. Some would have to scratch out wife or kids or grandkids. It's wonderful to love your family. But, folk, it's not wonderful to be a slave to them. There's always something you're living for, and whatever it is you're living for, you are enslaved to that. And the idea of becoming a follower of God is scratching out that name and putting God's name there. Folks, it's the only place to find freedom. The problem is everybody needs freedom, and they don't even realize it. The paradox is the only way to find freedom is to become a slave of the one who will set you free. And by the way, that's God. And that leads to our third lesson. There is always a price to be paid for freedom. Folks, this is not just acknowledging that Jesus had to die to set me free. It's not just focusing on the last plague. In order to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, a lamb, the death of the firstborn lamb, had to be slain. John the Baptist points to Jesus at his first meeting. Remember this? First time he sees him, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We know that. We know a price has to be paid. I want us to go a little deeper. What is God trying to communicate? Folks, if we understand the price of freedom, I think we will understand the whole concept of freedom so much better. God said, remember this, as often as you meet, you're supposed to do what we just did a few minutes ago. Every single week, God wants his people to focus in large part to what we're going to be talking about right now. Jesus died for us. He was the lamb. All other lambs, even back then in the plague, the last plague, all other lambs pointed to him. Why? Why couldn't God just say, I understand you're really sorry about this. I'm glad you're sorry. We'll just forget it ever happened. Forgive me for being so blunt, but to put it in those kind of terms, you have to be pretty naive. We've talked about the nature of God before, so this morning I'd like to focus on the nature of sin itself. Folks, sin is a violation of God's standards. You could put it this way, and you'd be right to say that. It's actually a violation of the very nature of God because God's standards are an expression of who he is. If God said, this is the way I created the world, this is who I am, this is the way things ought to be, then to sin is to go against that. To go against that simply means something has been wronged. Something is not as it ought to be. And if something is wrong, if something has been abused, if something has been violated, if a sin has been committed, if you put it in those kinds of terms, in the term itself, you see, there's a problem that needs to be fixed. And to fix this problem, folk, there always is a price to be paid. So I'll give you some examples. You'll get this one. You'll understand this. Let's start with a physical example. Let's say that there's a couple that come over to your house that you really like. Okay? I mean, you, you, you're, the, you're the husband and wife or you're the mom and dad, and you've spent a lot of time with them. You just enjoy them. And you say, let's just go over to, let's just go over to uh, Terre Haute and let's eat. And they drive their car, and you drive their car, you drive your car, and as soon as the meal is over, you know, you've had a great time, they have to leave a little bit earlier than you do, and you say to them, as they're saying, hey, we've got we've to get out of here, you say to them, you know, we've had such a great time, I'll just get the check, okay? And you're delighted to do that. So they leave before you do, you're paying the bill, you're leaving the tip, all that other stuff. And then you're finally getting out to the parking lot, and you want what's happening. They're coming back in. And they're, they, they meet you, and they say, I'm sorry. I wasn't watching. I backed into your car. Something wrong has happened. Cars are not supposed to run into other cars. But this is more than just a fender bender. They pushed your bumper into your tire. Your car can't be moved. 
Let's say you have to have a moving car as part of your job. This is something you can't just let go. The car has to be fixed. Folks, there's two options then. You can let them fix it, or you can say, you know what? You're such dear friends. You're sorry about what happened. We'll just pretend like this never happened. Just go home. Life will be okay. I'll take care of it, and we'll forget this ever happened. Folks, does the damage go away? No. The option is this. If you don't make them pay, you're going to have to pay because something's been violated. Something's been abused. Something's been wrecked. Something is not as it should be. Therefore, to make it right, a price has to be paid. And the only options that we have here is who's going to pay for it. So if you're the guy that rammed into my car, to be forgiven means you don't have to pay for it. But it doesn't mean that no price, that no price needs to be paid. Folks, you get that, don't you? You get that the price has to be paid on the physical side. Now let's go to the emotional realm. Let's, ha let's, have a f let's say that you have a friend. At least you thought they were a friend. But you were close enough to them that you confessed some very personal things in your life. Some things that you were not proud of and some things that you wanted prayer for. In fact, you read the book of James and it says that you're supposed to confess your sins to one another and pray for each other. You really unloaded and you said, I need your help. I need your support. I need your prayers. And then a week or two later, you find out this friend of yours has been telling everybody about your private stuff. And not only are they telling people about your private stuff, they kind of put a little spin on it. They're literally lying about you. They're gossiping. They're lying. And you finally found out that the source is this person who you confided in. Now, let me ask you this. I personally believe more damage has been done in this situation than your other friends hitting your car. When you say there's some damage that's been done, something that hurts, let's deal with this. So the person comes back to you and says, I've really been convicted because what I did was wrong. I, I'm so sorry. Would you please forgive me? A lot of us might, me, might say, what do you mean forgive you? See, there's the potential to say, let's just pretend this never happened. Let's just go on with life. Folks, there's a price to be paid. And what it means is, You let them off the hook, but you have to live with people giving you those looks. You have to live with the knowledge that there's been some terrible things spread about you. There's been lies and people talking behind your back and the relationships you thought you had, not just with this one person, but relationships you thought you had have been damaged. There is a price to pay. Folks, I'm trying to get in your mind that every time there is a sin, there is a price to pay. The question is not, is there a price? The question is, who pays it? And that's what makes Jesus' sacrifice so beautiful. Because sin, I, I want you to get this in mind, sin does not just go away. It doesn't. It can't just be swept under the rug. Look, let's go to the plagues. One of the things you look at when you look at the plagues, and I've said this before, God could have done much bigger plagues. He could have made a mountain move. He could have zapped a bunch of people dead and brought them back to life. And we're thinking, couldn't you just prove that you're God? He could have done anything. Folks, do you get this? He spoke this world into existence. Adam was made instantly. And by the way, I think... He was pretty good. He lasted 900 and... I don't remember if it's 929 or 930 years. He was pretty good. Folks, these plagues... This is, God wasn't doing a raw display of power on these plagues. These plagues are God showing the gods that the Egyptians had worshipped. 
like the Nile God, the frog God, the fly God, all these other gods that were worshipped, they were not gods at all. Can I put it this way? The masters they were serving were the wrong masters. See the point God is making? But there's another point God is making. Why these kind of plagues? And I'll tell you why. Because these are the natural outcome of walking away from God. Can I go back to the story where the person violated you or brought damage into your life because they spread lies and they gossiped about you? If you look at a person like that, who constantly lies, who says things behind other people's backs, what kind of, what kind of life is that person going to live? Folks, they're not going to have a whole lot of close friends. Would you want to be close to somebody like that? A lot of times, sin itself, there's a price to be paid. And we're only paying by, and we are paying by committing the sin itself. Folks, sin is walking away from God and the way God created this world. And when you don't live by the standards of God, there's always a price to be paid. And when you don't live by the standards of God, in so living that way, you are destroying and you are enslaving your own life. And part of being free is learning to live how God wants you to live. Remember this, when God took the children of Israel out of Egypt, you know where he took them to? A mountain called Sinai. And you know what he did there? He gave them the Ten Commandments. He set them free, and then he gave them a standard to show them. This is how to live the best life possible. This is what I want you to do. And this is what I don't want you to do. Now, there's a guy named Jeff from Indiana. He's about my age. <clears throat> A few years ago, he had two young men come to stay with him. They were foreign exchange students. One was from Denmark, the other was from Spain. And I don't know if this happened the first day they were there, or maybe it was the second or third day. But they'd unpacked some of their things, and he was talking to them about the town in Indiana, about that small town they lived in, and the various things around town, and some of the basic things. He said, well, we'll be doing this, and we'll be doing that. But he also wanted to present just a few boundaries. He said, you know, you're going to live with me, and here's some things I expect. Now, Jeff is a strong, committed Christian, so one of the first things he wanted them to know was, uh, I'm not going to have a lot of rules to put on you and encumber you while you're here, but I do have one expectation. You're in my house, and you're going to go to church with me on Sundays. He didn't ask for any response. He just kind of let it go. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was just kind of laying things out. Well, about 20 or 30 minutes later, he, he's left. He's in the next room, and both the boys have had a chance to talk to each other, and they came in and they said, we appreciate your hospitality, but we don't want to go to church with you. We're not going. He didn't get upset. He didn't preach to them. He just looked at them and said, you know what? I can't make you go. You're well within your rights. Here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow morning, because it's too late today already, but tomorrow morning, we're going to go back down to the agency who set all these things up, and we're going to find some other place for you to stay. He said, I can't make you go to church. If you're going to stay in my house, you're going to church. You know what? It wasn't 10 minutes later they came to him and said, we decided we can go to church with you. Simple story, but profound implication of what we're talking about right now. God has given us, every single one of us, a freedom of choice. Folks, you do not have to make God your master. You don't. You do not have to live by the standards you find in Scripture. But if you want to be free, if you want the only one who can actually pay the price for your freedom... If you want to find the kind of life that deep down you've always been looking for, there's only one place to find it, and it's by making him your master and becoming his slave and doing what he wants you to do. I, I just got one question, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. 
if you're not in Christ, if he's not on your title, how long are you going to let Satan be your master? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is so powerful. I thank you that you want to be our master. I cannot imagine the thrill that the Israelites had as they left that night because the price had been paid for their freedom. Not only did they have freedom, they had a chance at a whole new life. And that's what you give us. Not just freedom to live the way we ought to and the way that's best for us, but also freedom to have a whole new life that's better and that can't be bought. Father, I pray that we might respond to what the Word says. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stay.